As Brother Chapel said, my name is Ethan Artanto, and I'm in the ninth grade, and I've attended Lancaster Baptist School since kindergarten. When you say, I forgive you, what do you actually mean when you say those three words? When the Roman soldiers mocked and spit at Jesus as he was suffering on the cross, what did Jesus do to those soldiers? Now Christ took our place on that cross, and if you were the one getting mocked and spit at, what would you do to those people? I know many of us have been hurt or offended and have hurt and offended other people. And the hardest part in that situation is having to forgive the person that wronged you. The root of forgive is the Latin word perdonare, meaning to give completely or excuse without reservation. Perdonare is also the source of our English word pardon. Now turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We will be reading several different passages, but I think this verse will set the foundation for this message. Ephesians 4, 32. The Bible says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Dale Carnegie visited Yellowstone National Park, where he saw a grizzly bear. The huge animal was in the center of a clearing, feeding on some discarded camp food. For several moments, he feasted alone because no other creature dared to step close. After a few moments, however, a skunk walked through the meadow. That skunk took his place next to the grizzly bear and started eating the bear's food. But the bear didn't even object, and Carnegie knew exactly why. Because it would cost the bear too much just to get revenge with that skunk. You see, you may be able to get even with your enemies, but in the long run, it's not worth it. So allow me to ask you a question today. Why do you forgive? What is your motive that drives you to forgive those who wrong you? Well, today, I want to share with you three reasons why you should forgive. The first reason why we should forgive is because of the portrayal of forgiveness we are displayed. Our first motive to forgive is because God first forgave us. Amen. Every sin, crime, lie that we have ever committed has been forgiven by Christ when he Amen. suffered and died on the cross. Jesus forgave those Roman soldiers who were that beat and mocked him. Forgiveness acknowledges that the other person has done something wrong and is truly at fault. In Luke 23, 34, as he was on the cross, Christ uttered, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And at that moment, Christ accepted the fact of their full offense against him. Deal Moody once said, The voice of sin is loud, but the voice of forgiveness is louder. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Daniel 9, 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. A little boy visiting his grandparents was given his first slingshot. He, was, he practiced using that slingshot many times in the woods, but he could never hit his target. As he came back to his grandma's backyard, he spied on her pet duck. On an impulse, he took aim and let the stone fly. Well, the stone did hit its target. The boy panicked, desperately he hit the dead duck in the woodpile only to look and see that his sister was watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Johnny told me that he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? And she whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally's help to make dinner. Sally smiled and said, oh, don't worry, that's taken care of because Johnny wants to do it. Again, she whispered, remember the duck. So Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and his sister's, he had enough. He couldn't stand it. So he confessed to his grandma that he had killed her duck. I know, Johnny. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make you her slave. You see, Christ loves you, so he forgave you. Don't be the one who would rather be enslaved to sin and not want to confess to Jesus when he has already forgiven you. Amen. Did you ever notice that the word give is part of forgive? That's because forgiveness is a precious gift that we've received and one we're called to give back to others. Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If 
any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. God has remained faithful to forgive us whenever we wronged him, so he should be the example that we follow that drives us to forgive others. Not only should we forgive because of the portrayal of forgiveness, but the second reason why we should forgive is because of our part in forgiveness. In other words, we have a duty to forgive. Jesus commands us several times in the scripture to forgive. Luke 6, 37 says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Matthew 18, 20, 21 to 22 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Whenever the words seventy times seven are mentioned in the Bible, it is symbolic for an infinite amount. Christians are called to forgive an infinite number of times because that is the number of times they are forgiven by God. Amen. Someone once said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. Matthew 6, 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Because you are a forgiven person, you are obligated by the king to be a forgiving person. When you refuse to forgive, you are putting yourself on a higher level than Jesus Christ himself. If Jesus Christ has forgiven you, how much more are you to forgive those who have wounded you? Not only should we, should we forgive because of our portrayal of forgiveness, our part in forgiveness, but lastly, because there is a pitfall in unforgiveness. A pitfall in unforgiveness. Two little brothers, Harry and James, had finished supper and were playing until bedtime. Somehow, Harry hit James with a stick, and bitter words and tears followed. Charges and accusations were still being exchanged as their mother prepared them for bed. She said, now boys, what would happen if either of you guys died and you guys never had the opportunity to forgive each other? Well, James spoke up. Well, okay, I'll forgive him tonight, but if we're both alive in the morning, you better watch out. <laughs> you see, how often do we hold onto our grudges and choose not to forgive? In the book of Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples a parable of what happens to people who do not forgive. Please turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew 18, 23. We'll start at verse 23 and end at, end at verse 35. Matthew 23, or Matthew 18, verse 23 says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 ta talents today is worth about 3.48 billion U.S. dollars. That is how much this man owed. Verse 25, But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Basically, this man's servant owed him a hundred pence, which is worth about $58, and comparing to $3.48 billion, that is practically nothing. Verse 29, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came unto their Lord, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the, unto the tormentors, so he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. If you refuse to forgive, if you refuse to release that offense, you are the one who suffers, not the other person. Unforgiveness makes you a bitter, angry, unloving, joyless person. This quote about forgiveness is so very true. Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness, serving time for someone else's crime. Let me read that one more time. Unforgiveness is choosing to stay trapped in a jail cell of bitterness, 
serving time for someone else's crime. In conclusion, you should forgive because of the portrayal of forgiveness Jesus has displayed when he died on the cross for your sins and for mine. We should also forgive because of your part in forgiveness that has been commanded by Christ. And lastly, because there is a pitfall of unforgiveness that Jesus warns you about. So the next time someone hurts or offends you, why don't you just forgive them? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we get the opportunity to gather here in your house today. I ask you to give all of us the strength to forgive those people who wrong us, Lord, and help us to apply these three reasons on why we should forgive to our lives. And help us not to be like the servant who was forgiven but didn't want to forgive. And if there's anyone here today who does not know you, who has not accepted your free gift of salvation, help them to get that settled so they can spend eternity with you. And in your name I pray. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, um, verses 19 through 21. I'd like to say thank you so much, Pastor, for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly, and I'm so thankful to preach to my church family. If you all are there, uh, verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Skip down to verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We make thousands of decisions every day, literally thousands. Cornell University estimates we make 35,000 decisions every day. That's not in a month, that's every day. The most important decisions, what we would eat, we make 226 times a day. Literally thousands of decisions. And each and every one of those decisions carries a consequence Good or bad, it all has a consequence. Several years ago, I was at Joshua Camp, so I'm staying in the dorms over here, and if you've ever been in the Joshua Camp storm, you know there's a closet, and right above it, there's a little shelf space. It's probably 10 feet up. Well, me and the little mischievous junior high friends I had, we decided one night we were going to climb up in those shelf spaces that are 10 feet up. So we moved the bunk bed up against the closet, and I proceeded to climb up. Well, all of a sudden, one of my friends ran the door and said, the counselor's coming. Well, I knew it wasn't a good thing to be up there, but my friend scooted the bed away from the closet, and there was no way for me to get down. I had a decision to make. One, I would stay up on that closet, and I would get in trouble. Now, me being in eighth grade, that was not the decision I was going to make. I was not going to take the punishment. So I saw that bunk bed maybe six feet away, and I thought to myself, I can make it. I'm going to jump from the closet and try and make it on my bed. And as soon as that counselor opens the door, I'll be laying in my bed, you know, obeying, because that's who I was. So I decided, I got on the very edge, and I leapt out, and right as I jumped, the counselor opened the door, and it hit my foot. And I fell 10 feet and landed on my back. I thought I died. My friend looked over on me, and he goes, you made the wrong decision. <laughs> Just like that, our decisions have consequences every single day. Today, we had our patriotic program. I love our country. I love that flag very much. But it's only because the decisions certain people made that our country is as free and where it is today. One of the decisions that was made was the signing of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. Founding fathers and men came together and they put their name on a piece of paper knowing there was a price to be paid if they were caught. Another decision was the South seceding from the Union a huge decision that affected our nation altogether. The decision to bomb Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 was a decision that shaped not only America but the world. Who knows where the world would be today if America had not been provoked into World War II. Another one, America recognizing Israel as a nation in 1948. You see Israel on the news today and because of America standing with Israel in 1948, I believe God has blessed our nation since then. Those are all huge decisions that affected our country and our world altogether. But every single decision you make personally has the same type of effect on your life. So my question to you today is, what, what is motivating your decisions? What are you making your decisions based upon? Are you doing it because of what you want? Then maybe it's a job, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a purchase you're about to make. Maybe for some of us that are younger, it's where we're going to go to college, who we're going to date, who we're going to marry. Huge decisions in our life. But what is your motivation in deciding those decisions? So today, notice with me three tools in decision making. First, 
we see the destination of your decisions. Matthew, 19, Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, Lay not up to yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Do you realize that every decision you make every day, its, it's consequences result, it has a destination. Either you're going to live your life and make your decisions based on what you can get now, the temporal, everything will be destroyed, or you will live your life for the things that moth nor rust will not destroy. It's eternal. A couple Sundays ago, Pastor David Mims gave a great principle on decision making. Don't make your decisions based on what you see, but rather on what God says. Don't make your decisions on what you see, but on what God says. Corinthians 4.18 tells us, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not are eternal. So many of us, we're living our lives every day, and the decisions we are making are temporal. It's for what we can gain now, and we don't realize every second that's going to be gone. In a second. It's like a vapor. The Bible says it's there, and then it's gone. Just like that. And that's why we're making our decisions. In uh, the very beginning, Adam and Eve, Eve made a very important decision one of the most important decisions, I would say, to take a bite of an apple. Genesis 2.16 says, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of good and evil thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. Thou shalt surely die. It's very clean and simple. In, in, verse, in chapter 3 and verse 6 it says, And when the woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband, and he did eat. She saw that it was good. She saw that it was pleasant for the eyes. She made her decision, decision based on what she saw. When the Bible clearly said, when God said to him, thou shalt surely die, don't make your decisions on what you see. Make your decisions on what God says. That was a pretty big decision, right? And it's easy for every single one of us to look back and go, Eve, Adam, what in the world were you thinking? All this suffering, all these punishments are because of you and that decision you made. But every single day, every single day we're making the same exact decisions based on what we see and not what God says. Um, how many of you have, actually you might not answer this, but how many of you have Bitcoin? Is there anyone in this building that has Bitcoin? Bitcoin was a digital cryptocurrency that came on the scene about 10 years ago. A British man in London, you might have heard of this story, a British man in London had a hard drive with a trove of Bitcoin, but it was worth $250,000 back then. So imagine how much it was worth today. This man had two identical hard drives though, and he, tell, he was telling the newspaper reporter that he accidentally threw away the wrong hard drive. 250,000, that, that is worth millions, millions in today. Gone, like that. He literally threw away his fortune, and it was gone. In fact, of the existing 18.5 million Bitcoin, around 20%, currently worth $140 billion, appear to be lost or otherwise in stranded wallets, according to the chain analysis. Hey, Christian, it's gone. It's money, it's monetary, it's temporal. What you see it's going to be gone. It can be thrown away. It can be destroyed in a second, in a vapor. It was gone forever. And what have you lived for? What did you make those decisions for? For yourself. Proverbs 27, 24. Riches are not forever. And doth the crown endure to every generation? It doesn't. That's a, that's a rhetorical question. It doesn't endure for every generation. Nothing you live for on earth, whether it's money or fame or success, will ever last. Make your decisions with eternity in mind, Christian. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter in the end. When you stand in front of Christ, he's going to ask, what did you do for me? There are people dying and going to hell, but we're making our decisions based on what we can get for ourselves. And one day, it's not going to matter. It's going to be matter, what did we do for Christ? Amen. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. What you put in eternity lasts forever. There are people dying and going to hell, and what are we doing for those people? Right. Secondly, we see the direction of your decision. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The saying goes, one man's treasure, one man's junk is another man's treasure. What is treasure? 
The definition of treasure is what you set your affections upon. Something I enjoy cannot be something you enjoy. Your treasure is not always my treasure. To say if you like sports, you're going to watch them, you can play them, because you like sports. If you love traveling, maybe you're going to book a, um, a plane trip, maybe you're going to book a trip somewhere because you enjoy that. That's what your affections are upon. That's your treasure. If you love Christ, you're going to talk about him. You're going to read his Bible. You're going to tithe. You're going to go soul winning. Why? Because you love him. You've set your affections upon him. Where your heart is, that's going to determine your decisions and your direction and eventually your destination. What you place your affections on, your heart is going to go to. If you get on the 40 and drive east and just keep driving and never stop, you're going to end up in a place called Wilmington, North Carolina. The 40 is the only one that goes across the United States, and that's where you'll end up. So let's say I get my driver's license first. I get in a car, and I start driving on the 40 east. And I keep driving in my head. I'm thinking, man, I want to go to Seattle. I want to go up north to Seattle. And the whole time I'm thinking, man, I'm going to Seattle. I'm going to Seattle. I'm going to Washington. But you just keep driving east. And I'm, got my, I'm not taking turns. I'm not getting off the 40. I just keep driving. Maybe stop for some gas or some snacks or something. But I just keep driving. And I'm thinking, man, I'm going to Seattle. This is going to be awesome. Maybe I'm going to go do some cool stuff in Washington. And I'm going, to end up, um, I'm going to end up in Wilmington, North Carolina, aren't I? And I'm going to get there and I go, what in the world happened, man? I was thinking in my head, I'm going to Seattle. I'm going to Washington. Why? Because I had a direction. I set my, like, my course was going somewhere. My car was driving somewhere. That's the same exact thing. We can make decisions all day in our head and we can go, man, I'm going to go soul winning. I'm a good Christian. I'm going to read my Bible. But if your affections are on something else, your affections aren't on God's word, you're headed in a different direction. Every, every decision you make is a step. It's, you're reading your Bible. You're going soul winning. You're having a good prayer life. It's, it's all in a direction. You can go the other way. Making bad decisions, let's say um, you're looking at things you shouldn't. You're listening to bad music. You have wrong influences in your life. Maybe you're, um, you're telling wrong jokes with your coworkers. You're walking in a different way. And how foolish would it be for me to keep making these decisions and a decision and a bad decision after a wrong decision, after another wrong decision. And I end up on this side of the platform and I think in my head, what in the world happened? In my head the whole time, I was thinking, man, I'm going that way. I'm living my life for Christ. As a young adult, my, I'm going to do something for Christ. But the decisions I made, they walked me this way. I had a direction. I set my affections on something else. I just keep going in the wrong direction. It's the same exact thing for where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. Your affections determine your direction. Yeah. Right. So with that being said, set your affections in the right direction. Amen. It is so critical that you set your affections on the eternal like we just saw. It is so critical that you live your life, you put your affections on things that will last, things that won't be destroyed, things that will last for Christ in the end when you get to heaven. So we've seen the destination, we've seen the direction of our decisions. Finally, in verse 33, we see the determinant of our decisions. If you read in verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? Seek ye first. Seek ye first. I love how plain and simple the Bible is. Thou shalt surely die, right? It says, seek ye first. Seek ye first. God isn't trying to confuse us. He says exactly what we need to know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's like God saying the same thing over again. Lay off for yourselves treasures, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasures there will be also, and then seek ye first. It's the same thing. In every single decision you make, seek God first. Seek God. Because you're taking a step in a certain direction, and if you don't seek God first, it's the wrong. You'll end up in the wrong destination. I work with my dad a lot doing some construction and stuff, and one day I just, um, my dad took me a job, and we're going to build a fence, right? It's a wooden fence. Lots of people don't do wooden fences anymore, but this person wanted a wooden fence built. So my dad, he made a wrong decision. He told me, Jared, you can do this by yourself. That was a bad decision, <laughs> right? So he trusted me. I'm probably, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. I was cocky. I was arrogant, and I was like, I'm going to knock this job out. My dad's going to be so proud of me. I can do this all on my own. Didn't ask any questions. My dad looked at me, and he gave me the level. He gave me all the tools I needed, but he gave me a level. And he said, no matter what you do, after you put in every board, Stick the level on top and make sure you're perfectly in the very center of that bubble. Because if not, your boards are going to get crooked, right? So I started. I uh, dug a little hole, put my pole, post in. You probably would have been proud of me at the beginning because, man, it looked like I knew what I was doing. I put in that pole, and I started screwing these poles in. And I looked at the level, and I was like, eh, 
I don't need this. Let me just eyeball it, right? So I looked at it, and I was like, it looks good. So I put the first board in, second board in, just down the line, board after board after board after board, just eyeballing it. Yes, it looked good, right? It looked good. And as I kept going on, doing it as fast as I can, I finally got to the end of the, the wall, and I looked back, and I went, oh, no. The wall, it kind of looks like this. It, like, started, and then it sloped down, right? And I said, what in the world happened? Do you know why my wall, my fence was sloped down? Because I didn't use the level. Because I didn't put that bubble. I didn't check and make sure that bubble was in the very center every single time. Because of that, I was just a little bit off on every pole, on every fence. It was just maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe one sixteenth of an inch. But it added up, didn't it? Maybe an eighth of an inch, another eighth of an inch, maybe a fourth of an inch. And eventually, you have an inch. And after a couple inches, you have half a foot. And after maybe 12 of those, you have a whole foot off, right? Why? Because I didn't use the level. Hey, God's word is our level. This right here, this is our level. This is our standard. And if you make every decision just eyeballing it, you're thinking, wow, it's just a small decision. I don't need God's word. I don't need counsel. I don't need to talk to my pastor. It's just it's a small decision. It looks okay. It looks good. Why? You're going to be just a little bit off and just a little bit off, and if you make your decision just a little bit off, and you keep making these decisions just a little bit off, eventually you're going to be over here going, what in the world went wrong? Why am I so far off the mark? Right. Don't ever get to a place, Christian, where you've, gotten to a, where you've gotten to that place and you're wondering, what happened? What went wrong? How did I get so far off the mark? But I didn't look at that fence, and I didn't. I was like, oh, no, I mean, my dad's not going to buy me a chicken sandwich on the way home. I'm in big trouble. No, the fence, it's... It can be fixed, right? My dad came over. He wasn't very happy, but he came over. And just like that, there's something called redemption. God, he can redeem us back. In, First Corinth, in Colossians chapter 1, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. In, verse, in chapter 20, Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works... Yet now he hath reconciled. So you could be in your mind right now. You're thinking, man, I'm way on that side of the platform. I should have been over there. Maybe you're farther down in your life and you're going, what in the world happened? You're in your mind by wicked works. But it, the verse doesn't end there. It has a comma and it says, yet now he hath reconciled. Jesus Christ sent his son to die on the cross. He gave his blood. He shed his blood so that we could be redeemed. We could have messed our fence all up. We could be a foot off the mark, but we are redeemed. We are purchased back. And just like my dad, he had to help me rebuild that fence. Christ has redeemed our life, and we can reconcile because of that. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. So as I conclude my message, let me ask you, are you in a place where you're wondering what happened? Maybe you're not even saved today. Maybe you're looking at me and you're wondering, well... I thought I was going the right direction anyway. I didn't know there was a standard. Hey, Jesus Christ sent his son to, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He gave his blood. He shed his blood so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be redeemed and bought back. So today we've seen the destination. Are you making your decisions with heaven in mind, with a heavenly destination? We've seen the direction. Are your decisions right now putting you on a path in a right direction? And we've seen the determinant. Make every decision with this book right here. This is the level. This is the standard God has given us. Seek ye first his word, and you make sure you're perfectly in the bubble every single time, and don't start to get off the course. And don't find yourself down the road wondering, what in the world happened? Why am I so far off the mark? Use God's word. Use his word. Try every decision you make. And if you are in a place, just know, you can reconcile. You are redeemed as a Christian. You can reconcile and come back. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this um, great opportunity and privilege I've had to speak your word, Lord. Thank you for the crowd and, Lord, how receiving they were. I pray that you'd help my um, message and your word about making decisions to resonate in someone's heart. Please bring everyone home safe, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's thank these young men for a wonderful message.